Dr. Andrew Treitz, our guest, he is a scientist, a professor, a director of the UBC Marine Mammal Unit. He also sits on uh, the uh, Stellar Sea Lion Recovery Team, which consists of? Uh, for the most part, recovery teams are made up of scientists, uh, often user groups as well. Uh, you find many recovery teams now could have fishermen represented on it, it could have environmental groups represented on it, and so Increasingly now, when species get listed, we have sort of the stakeholders, those that would be affected by it, and mm -hmm. so they want to come to a consensus. So more and more, it's recovery teams are being put together with stakeholders to come up with a plan that will see the species recover and get off the list. Okay, so uh, why are they on the list? Do we know? Well, you know, stellar sea lions range from California up the coast to Alaska, across the Aleutians and down to northern Japan. And the interesting thing is that we know that genetically there are two different populations of sea lions. And the, that line in the sand is, is sort of from Prince William Sound straight across. And everything south of there, so southeast Alaska, British Columbia, Oregon, Washington, those animals have been increasing uh, quite rapidly. But when you go elsewhere across Alaska to Russia, they've been declining. And so, for example, in, in um, Alaska, they had about 350,000 stellar sea lions were breeding there um, back in the 60s and into the 70s. And then almost overnight, they started to decline. They've declined by over 90%. And so today, the population number is less than, than 35,000. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit like, you know, you go to BC Place, and you've always mm -hmm. gone there, and it's always been sold out and every seat is full, and you go back one day, and all of a sudden, 90% of the seats are empty. Yeah. And you look around and say, where is everybody? It means the team is not playing that <laughs> well. But uh, it, it's startling, the dramatic decline. Uh, what, what do you think is happening? Well, I know there's several, there's some wild notions, there's some science. What do you I think is going on? I tell you, when I first on? started off, you know, I thought, well, this is an open and shut case. Mm. Um, we know that at the same time they're declining, there was a big buildup of fisheries. Today, the second biggest fishery in the world is catching the number one prey item of stellar sea lions, which is walleye pollock. Okay, so and overfishing, perhaps. Perhaps, and so, so and that's what I thought when I first started into this. Uh, pollock has turned into something you've probably eaten without realizing you're also eating sea lion food, which is um, surimi, the artificial crab. Mm -hmm. And so maybe remember when that came on the market? Yes. So that, that is about the same time as sea lions declined. It turns out, though, when you start looking at where was the fish caught, how much, and everything else, nothing adds up. We've not been able to find any connection outside of a coincidence in time. So they were in the room together, mm. but we can't find anything other than circumstance. And they're not, like, dragging and, and catching them in the nets or anything like this that. This is, is strictly food supply. And this fishery is one of the cleanest in the world. It's very conservatively managed. They take a small proportion of the total stock. The nets are not dragged on the bottom. Uh, it's in the midwater. And so it, it gets a green uh, stamp from some of the groups that are out assessing, you know, how healthy is this fishery, right. and is this a fish we should be eating? Is the pollock polluted? Uh, is there no. something internal going on? The fish are polluted? The, listen well, to this theory. Uh, I'll tell you where, where we ended up with this, is that we met this fellow whose daughter, he was a fisherman himself, and his daughter was trying to save harbor seal pups. Mm. And she was discovering she was getting, her dad was donating some of his fish, which was pollock. And she found that her pups were, were getting unhealthy and some of them even died. And so we started looking at this and we came up with a theory called the junk food hypothesis. And essentially what it's saying is that the reason that they're declining is because they're eating too much of a poor quality food. Mm -hmm. So for you and I, junk food would be hamburgers. For a sea lion, junk food is celery. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem seems to be it's sort of the equivalent to putting you into a field of celery and saying, look at all this food that's here, and you probably know that you're not going to survive eating celery. Right. There's not enough energy in Mostly there. Mostly water. So we started a research program at the Vancouver Aquarium, and we started trying to test some of these theories. The energy food. The energy the one, the junk food hypothesis. And what we found is that a young animal, so let's say one and two-year-olds, that they cannot get enough energy out of pollock. Mm -hmm. uh, their stomachs are full and they're still hungry and they can't grow normally. So it appears that what's happening in the wild is that mothers in this ocean that is full of now white fish 
are keeping their pups for an extra one or two years. They can produce energy rich milk and then the pup is now big enough it needs less food to maintain itself and it can survive very well. Okay, but physiologically you must be seeing uh, sea lions who are skinny no, and that's near the other, death that, or not. That's the thing is we're not seeing that. Um, all the animals look physically healthy. But again, we discovered by our feeding studies at the Vancouver Aquarium that when we gave them animals pollock or we fed them herring, and so the, the good fish for a sea lion are any of the dark fleshed ones. They're full of oils. Right. The white fleshed ones are the ones that don't have uh, very much fat in them. And probably and, don't live as long. Uh, I make things up. I'm not a scientist. <laughs> no, no, no. They're, they're, they're living. So, some of those whitefish live even longer. Okay. But what we found is that we can create two animals that look almost identical on the outside. The difference is that the one that ate the white flesh fish has to eat more of it. Right. But when you look at their body composition, the one that ate white fish has got about this much fat on it, mm -hmm. and the other one has got about this much fat. Uh, so the other one has got more protein, but it's not as healthy because for a healthy marine mammal, they need to have lots of fat. If you're a marine mammal, lots <laughs> of fat right. is good. If you're a human, not so much fat. Exactly. Okay, so that's the difference. So what are the wild notions? Uh, man uh, and this may not be a wild notion, or what are, what are the theories? Man-made climate change, perhaps, affecting them, temperature of the water? Well, that's an interesting thing, too, is, you know, this decline of over 90%, has this ever happened before? Or is this something to do with global warming? Because we now have climate records pretty detailed that go back 100 years. Right. And what we see is there's, there's been periodic shifts when the water's gone from warm to cold to warm again. And it's during these warm periods that these poor quality fish for sea lions become super abundant. Um, and we need to go back to this cold water period. So this seems to have been a natural thing that's gone on for thousands and thousands of years. But what's changed the game is global warming. We're now seeing this creeping up of baseline temperatures, mm -hmm. which means that in the future, we may still have these shifts, but now it's not gonna go from warm to cold, it's gonna go from warm to hot. Um, and so what we're seeing now may be the way it's gonna be for the foreseeable future. Now one of the other things in this is to realize that sea lions further south, so here in British Columbia, they are booming. Uh, our population now is over 20,000 animals, and, but they're not eating these white fish. Uh, they used to when our numbers were low. Today, what they're eating are things like herring, sardines, mm. sand lance. All um, good for you. All good food. And for, good for a marine mammal. That's right. Obviously. How do you tag a sea lion? How, how do you find a sea lion, tag it, chase it, figure it out? Um, it depends on the animals. When they're young, you can, you can approach and pick them up. As they get older, we're typically using tranquilizing darts mm. to put the animal asleep, and then you can approach it. We are, though, here in Vancouver working with animals that we've had both at the aquarium and we've gone one step further, we've taken them out into the open ocean. And so we have free swimming animals. They wear a harness, mm -hmm. um, so they carry scientific instruments. They also have tracking tags in case they decide they want the afternoon off and go AWOL on us. Like a GPS tag? But it's, it is that, <laughs> really? but it's, it's connected to a satellite. Um, and really? So, so, so technology We've got plays technology. A big These are high-tech animals. But you know, we've been doing this now, and, and it's simply taking your dog out for a walk. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most fun things to do is to go out in the wild with your trained sea lion and uh, have them collect data and share some of the secrets about how they partition their time, how do they save oxygen, how do they capture the fish at different right. depths. So when you come up close and personal with a sea lion, are you in any danger? Are they friendly? Um, certainly with our trained animals, there's no danger. They are friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, but a wild sea lion particularly for stellar sea lions, they're very shy. Um, they tend to avoid people. You have to be quite cautious as you try to approach. Males, that's a slightly different story, but Always for the most been. part, <laughs> uh, they're a bit bolder and easier to approach, but overall, um, they're quite shy, and most of the breeding sites are further offshore, mm -hmm. more difficult to get to. We do, though, particularly in the springtime, in the Strait of Georgia, when the herring are spawning, uh, we have literally thousands mm -hmm. of sea lions coming in, and it's a phenomenal a spectacle of nature to come and watch the sea lions uh, in with the seals, the birds. Uh, it's a real feeding feast. I'm sure. Uh, and going back to the why, uh, reproductive failure, are they having fewer uh, pups? That, that would be the theory is that during the years up in Alaska when they're eating white flesh fish, they're keeping the pups longer, so that cuts the birth rate by 50% or maybe 75%, whereas here in BC, it would appear the animals are having a pup every single year because they can wean the pup at one year because that pup is now going to eat 
these energy-rich fish. So what has to happen before the day comes when there will not be such a uh, magnificent animal as a stellar sea lion? Well, there, I think there always will be sea lions. The question is, will we ever fill BC Stadium again up right. to capacity? Um, there will always be sea lions. The question is, will they ever get back to that number? Mm. And right now, in theory, they will get back, but the global warming issue complicates it. More than anything? More than anything right now, I'd say. So it's not pesticides and uh, no. damaged fish or low no. populations? It's there, there is one other little warming. twist to the story, which is killer whales. And mm. there is a possibility because we have one such a race of killer whales that specializes in eating marine mammals. And now that the stellar sea lions are so low in Alaska, um, it appears that the killer whales could be cropping off a greater proportion and therefore they could be preventing recovery. Okay, and you're on the killer whale recovery <laughs> team too, so it could be a conflict of interest. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you Thank too. you so much. I'll come and see uh, that magnificent whale, I promise. Great. Okay, uh, Professor Andrew Trice from UBC.